This podcast includes graphic depictions of true crime cases and may contain explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, this is Robin. This is Jackie. And this is Amanda. And you are listening to We Saw the Devil, a podcast dedicated to horror, true crime, and all things macabre. If you want to follow us between shows, don't forget to check us out online. You can go to our website at www.wesawthedevil.com. You can follow us on Instagram at We Saw the Devil Podcast or on Twitter at We Saw the Devil. And if you want to follow specific co hosts' social media, you can find the links to those on our website as well. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of We Saw the Devil. This episode is part two of our East Area Rapist series, and we'll cover the earliest known or potentially linked crimes of Joseph James D'Angelo. If you haven't, go back and listen to part one, where we discussed his childhood all the way to his breakup with Bonnie Colwell. So this episode, we will focus on some of the earliest crimes that could be potentially linked to Joseph James D'Angelo. It is not 100% confirmed yet, but based off of the MO, we feel like it should be included in our outline. But before we get into that, let's talk Patreon. So thank you so much, guys. We love our patrons. Big shout out to our executive producers, Ian, Iris, and Shauna S. And a big hey to our newest one, (laughs) William. We love you. Thank you, William, as a longtime listener from back in the days of all horror. So like literally a decade, and we really appreciate that. And then also the rest of our patrons, we have Amy, Derek, Michelle, Nikki, and Shauna F. We love you, appreciate you, and thank you very, very much. We did put out last week a Patreon-only episode on the otaku killer. Super creepy. Super disgusting, super creepy. If you are interested in getting kind of like nittier, grittier cases and hearing those, we have Patreon only episodes every month. So feel free to check out our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash we saw the devil. Or you can go to our website, we saw the devil.com. Perfect. And thank you so much to those that have been sharing your pictures of your goodies. I love seeing them. If you wouldn't mind us sharing them, post them publicly either on Instagram or Facebook and hashtag WSTD gear. And I'd be happy to share them too. Yeah, it it literally makes my day. And don't forget to we have the Patreon only private Facebook group. And I love it when people get their mail and post pictures of themselves in there. It literally makes my day. Right? I know it's my favorite thing. So thank you guys. Okay, so one thing that we would really quickly like to address is in the previous Lori Vallow update, we didn't finally, guys, it happened. We are not immortal. We are not gods. (laughs) We made a mistake. (laughs) Right. Quick one. So what we were doing is we were going through the discovery request and we were going through the people listed in there. And there was a couple that we just misspoke about. So I apologize. And we will make sure to clear it up in our next Vallow update when new information comes up. That is true. So now that we've gotten all of that out of the way, again, throwing it out there. If you have questions, comments, <laughs> complaints, concerns, if you're concerned for our well-being, email us <laughs> at we saw the devil at gmail.com. Uh, we love hearing from you. We read each and every email and we get back to you as promptly as possible. But we've gotten some incredible emails with additional information, right? Like supplemental information for our episodes mm-hmm. and stuff. So reach out to us. Yeah. Same thing on the YouTube channel. A lot of people discuss the case a lot. And I even learned mm-hmm. from those. So thank you guys for for reaching out in any capacity. Yes, Absolutely. Yeah, so I guess that about sums up the intro. Let's get into Joseph James D'Angelo's just like evil reign of terror <laughs> for the last 40 Jesus, yeah. years. One quick piece before we get into that is the update on his trial. So as we stated in the last episode, the April 22nd hearing was canceled due to coronavirus. The Rona is setting it out. So the defense was set up to argue their position that the alleged crimes committed outside of Sacramento County cannot be tried in a Sacramento County courtroom. The court still has the original May 12th dates in their calendar system. That was the date that the preliminary trial was set to begin. But it's unconfirmed if the dates have actually been moved to July. So it seems as though the date is actually going to be moved to July, but the system, Sacramento County system, has not been updated yet. 
Um, there are an incredible number of witnesses, and due to age, health status, are potentially vulnerable to coronavirus, and other courts across the country have used teleconference and video technology. It is currently unknown at this moment if GSK EARONS <laughs> will be able to use this technology. Honestly, I hope not. I hope he just has an extra month to hang out in there, an extra month or two, doing nothing. <laughs> and last month, right? And last month, 421 Sacramento County inmates were released to help mitigate the spread of coronavirus, and he was not among them. Well, good. <laughs> mm-hmm. honestly he's not going anywhere his his stuff is a little bit more intense than i think the people released do you think he talks on the bowl i hope so honestly it's no. the same jail. i hope he doesn't because is it no it's not it is look it up hold it is on the same, hold on yeah. <laughs> pause pause this. it's the same jail amanda and, and tell everyone what you are referring to Okay, so if you have not is it still on netflix no i think they stopped doing it because <gasps> Oh, well, I don't know if it's still on Netflix, but I think they stopped. Like, I wanted a season two, but it, 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 I don't think it's coming. Netflix had an original show called Jailbirds, and it took place in the Sacramento County Jail. And it basically just showed, like, it was just a reality show, right? Similar to something that you would watch inside Lockup or Lockup or whatever on MSNBC. But, like, it gets a personal. I can't believe that. You just blew my mind that it's the same place. Are I you feel really like impressed that, right now? That, I am so thoroughly impressed. <laughs> However, I feel like that place looked looked a little too like easygoing <laughs> for what he should be <laughs> going through. Yes. Like they're making friends through the toilet and like dating through the toilet. It's so weird. <laughs> if you haven't checked out that show and you're real bored, <laughs> it is well worth your time. Oh my gosh. I just remember I was putting together furniture when you introduced me to that show and then my furniture did not get built for two days because I had to watch <laughs> it. <laughs> it's amazing. So as Amanda said, some of these crimes may or may not, that we're going to be discussing in this episode, may or may not have been committed by D'Angelo. And the reason that we're covering them, though, right? And as we stated in episode one, we are not doing a deep dive into this entire case as a whole, right? We are going to kind of give a broad overview. If we did a deep dive into this case, it, we may as well get a PhD because there's so Seriously. much information. Like the dates, it's absolutely insane. And there have been multiple podcasts. Um, there's an incredible pro boards for it. There's a, there's a wealth of information out there. So we're going to provide a close overview of the case and then mm-hmm. provide sources for you if you want to read further. We'll hold your hands through the, the first few steps. Yep. Get you caught up and then we'll follow the trial as it progresses if they decide to do it anytime soon. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so the first episode of this was his background, his upbringing, uh, college, Navy, and then his um, engagement and broken engagement to Bonnie Colwell, a very mm-hmm. integral figure in this case. You'll find out why later. Yes. Um, so this episode, we are going to cover some other potential crime series where some people do and others do not believe that he was actually connected. Mm-hmm. Um, so the ones that we'll be covering this evening are the Exeter Ransacker, the Cordova Cat Burglar, the East Sacramento Flasher, and the Cordova Meadows Burglar. So that'll lead us into the Visalia Ransacker, which will be covered next time. Yes, and that crime spree is getting an entire episode all by itself. This guy was busy. And we're going to go through the, you know, the years that we know, and a lot of overlaps so my mind is still blown how one person can do all of this and still lead you know a somewhat normal life during it isn't that crazy i don't get it i don't know how we had enough time i don't even have enough time to do anything (laughs) right and then magically this man is like ransacking and flashing and burglarizing and and working and getting engaged and dating like what sure sure uh, I mean, his time management skills are pretty awesome, I guess. I will give him I, that. That's impressive. Uh, I mean, he's an asshole and he's the worst thing in the world, but time management, sure. All right. The first instance, I guess with a moniker, right, that a lot of people attribute to Joseph James D'Angelo is the Exeter Ransacker. And it's unknown because, A, it was an Exeter and he, at this point, now we have to pick up from our last episode, right? So he trans, remember, he was in the Navy, 
Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is before he met Bonnie, before he went to college. He was in the Navy. So he transferred from the Canberra to the Piedmont ship in July of 1967. And that same year, it returned to San Diego. The Piedmont deployed to Vietnam in March of 1968, but Joseph James Angelo did not go. He was actually photographed for the Piedmont yearbook during that window of time, probably in late 1967 for the 1968 yearbook. And he had a metric shit ton of terminal leave saved up after being deployed for so long on the Canberra, and also possibly some medical leave for the missing fingertip incident. He did not deploy to Vietnam on the Piedmont. And he enrolled actually in Rockland College a month before the Piedmont returned from Vietnam. If Joseph James D'Angelo was in fact the Exeter ransacker, there are multiple different possibilities of this. There's a really great, 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 great podcast that has actually covered this entire case as a whole, and it's called 12-26-75. And they actually have done an incredible amount of research, but they determined that D'Angelo's sister, Becky, lived in Exeter in 1968. It's unknown as far as when like what part of 1968 or where if Joe was the Exeter ransacker, he could have actually been based out of his sister's home. Like, could it have been Mm. a transitional time? You know, after he got out of the Navy, he just stayed with his sisters for a little bit before he went back to college to Sierra Rockland college. It would have been 297 miles. So it would have been a 300 mile drive for him to go just be the Exeter ransacker. Got it. Well, and yeah, there's reports that he lived with his mom and stepdad for a while too. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was just, he'd go and visit her and like stay a week or two. I don't know. Interesting. And this is something that we both really, and we're going to keep reminding you periodically throughout this episode, (laughs) all of these series, the ransacker, the flasher, the burglar, the cat burglar, a lot, almost all of these dates overlap, right? Like Mm -hmm. almost all of these different sprees are running concurrently at the same time. Yes. We will do our best to make sure that you're aware of that transition. Right. And the reason why we bring it up too, is the MO is very similar and it's, evolving as he continues so it makes like a good timeline for how he evolved through the years Mm -hmm. and then also there was talk before that a lot of these crimes were linked in some fashion so yes exactly now one theory too is that don't forget that joe had a brother named john Right. And now John has a, a lengthy criminal record for burglaries himself. Also, there's a witness sketch of the Exeter ransacker, and there are similarities between Joe's brother John and the Exeter ransacker. Yeah, for sure. When you have them side by side, they look fairly similar. I mean, especially for like someone trying to recount something. Yes. And, you know, and two, right? Like, as we continue, or if you know a lot about the East Era Rapist and and the crimes further down the road and the rapes, you'll know that a lot of victims said that they either heard Joe talking to someone or heard another voice entirely. Now, I can understand how sometimes, you know, victims may not pick up on um, you know, mishe- may, may mishear things or, you know, because they're panicked, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it has been speculated on a lot of the pro boards and so on and so forth that Joe may have actually had an accomplice at times. Um, and it, a lot of people have speculated that it could have been his brother. Again, completely unsubstantiated, but this is ta- taking law enforcement statements as well. But the extra ransacker operated as a whole, right? And like we said, just said, other sprees were interspersed between this. But he operated from April of 1968 through April of 1976. So a long time. So far, there are 61 crimes in total attributed to the Exeter ransacker. A lot of work. The Exeter ransacker, he was a ransacker. So he would come into your house and, you know, quote, fuck shit up. He took a lot of the same items. Now, as Amanda mentioned a moment ago, the MO is incredibly important when you're talking about Joseph James D'Angelo because he does evolve, but he does a lot of the same stuff. The Exeter Ransacker took a lot of the same items that the Visalia Ransacker would end up taking. Piggy banks, coins, guns. He would actually leave like cold, hard money laying where it was. Mm -hmm. at times he would leave valuables like watches and you know things like that he would only take certain items he also ransacked the same house twice so on may 4th of 1968 and then also again on july 23rd 1968 he hit don walter's home at avenue 300 he hit it twice and the east area rapist had a pattern of hitting the same house twice as well 
Mm-hmm. Now, in 1970, when Joe was engaged to Bonnie, there are only two known Exeter ransacker incidents that year. Well, he was busy taking her on these creepy adventures. Creepy adventures, having, you know, really weird sex to the doors. Yeah. And also, he was over 300 miles away from Exeter. Mm-hmm. It is a little suspicious there. In 1971, there are significantly more Exeter ransacker incidents. So there is a possible 16 in 1971 alone, but the previous year, there were only two. So again, was he too busy with Bonnie in college to really, you know, flesh out those crimes? Late 1970 is when Bonnie rejected him and broke off the engagement. So did that spark the the reoccurrence of the Exeter ransacker crimes in 1971 when they were at their strongest? I mean, he had more time on his hands, right? Now, on September 10th of 1972, he hit four times in one night. He would steal items from one house and then actually take them to the next house that he burglarized and leave them there. He would move items from room to room. He would take things, uh, bags, purses, and just dump the contents outside without taking anything. And all of that, that behavior is just all directly tied to the MOs of the Visalia Ransacker and East Area Rapist both. So a lot of ties here, right? Mm -hmm. Joe started working at the Exeter Police Department, how funny, on May 19th of 1973. And funny enough, there's no reported Exeter ransacker activity in April or May of 1973. Interesting. Well, and also in June of 1973, he was in the the Exeter Sun article about stopping burglaries. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I... Luckily, I was able to find a scan of that newspaper. So it was Wednesday, uh, June 20th, 1973. And basically, he stopped two attempted burglaries. Um, I'm sure he did says, himself. <laughs> right. Well, it says on June 13th, Officer Joe D'Angelo observed a person attempting to break into a vehicle near the fairway apartments. D'Angelo pursued the suspect who fled on foot, but failed to apprehend him. And then also it looks like uh, Sergeant Fox and Officer D'Angelo on the night of June 18th also stopped another burglary at a shell station. Yeah, wasn't he on a task force of some sort for burglaries? Yeah, I've read about this task force that he was on. And it just seems like, you know, when they talk about him being uh, a policeman, that was primarily what he was working on is burglaries, which is very strange. And then also... If he was on, you know, like this task force for it, they would give him more information, essentially, how to be a better criminal. No, exactly. And he would have time to stake out, too, you know, homes. Mm -hmm. And um, he had a lot of information there, just right at his fingertips by being a police officer. And a lot of unsupervised time, too. Mm -hmm. Well, and one one thing that I read, and it could be completely speculative, someone had mentioned that if he was indeed on this burglary task force, they also had certain homeowners that would call in and go, hey, I'm going to be out of town from this day to this day. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that would give him, you know, the upper hand being able to stake out these areas too, knowing that no one was there. Yes, no, is, that is actually true. In small towns in the 1970s, and especially with a very, very, very small police force like Exeter had, that is actually correct. Super strange. And I feel like just working on the in this police force just gave him way too much information to work with and, and do bad things. Mm-hmm. So here are just some highlights of the Exeter spree. So Exeter and Visalia, like we said, Visalia we will be covering in the next episode, are neighboring towns. So it wasn't a 300-mile drive. They were literally neighboring towns. Mm -hmm. Joe's sister lived in Exeter in the 60s. I don't know when she left, but she was actually living there. There were over 30 break-ins in Exeter the same year that the Visalia ransacker started up. So the Exeter ransacker, his crime series actually stopped and went dormant Hmm. the same year that the Visalia ransacker started up with a very similar, similar MO. So you can draw your own conclusions from that. His spree did, in fact, start two years after Joe was discharged from the Navy. And another piece, too, that we will tie into a future episode is between 1973 and 1974 with some of these ransacker incidents, there were a lot of bicycles 
stolen from the home, the garage outside of the home, and then they were used and then dumped on the side of the road. And East Area Rapist, this was a massive MO of his. He would take Mm -hmm. some sort of transportation bicycle and then dump it. A lot of, you know, things are, are, a lot of pieces are, have a a lot of glaring similarities, hence why we're covering this to begin with, even though it hasn't been officially attributed to him. After 1973, when Joe joined the Exeter Police Department, there was a general escalation, right? There were more and more and more ransackings. And I wonder if that was because he was just more confident because he had all of that patrol information. I mean, that definitely could be the case. Well, and he knew, I'm sure, you know, where the police would be at a certain time and how fast he had to get away. And he would take underwear, and this is an MO again that has has crossed um, sprees, is he would take the underwear and ransack, throw them around, stack them in one room, or steal them outright. So, like, underwear was a big thing for him. And he would usually make entry through a screen or sliding door, but he was not put off by the people being present. Like, they could be asleep in their bed, and he would just come right on in. That did not put him off at all. Home, gone, asleep, you know, it didn't matter. He would break into your home and steal your shit. Well, and then leave it places. <laughs> and then leave it in different in different places. So one date in particular that I want to to state is March 19th of 1974. This date itself is truly, truly, truly important because it is the first Visalia Ransacker attack that happened on the same date as an Exeter Ransacker attack. March 19th of 1974 is the beginning of the Visalia Ransacker spree. It also took place on the same day that an ER attack took place. So this is yet another Tuesday attack, and this time it happened in two separate towns by, on two separate sprees. Piggy banks were stolen in both locations on that same night. And again, common MO there. There will be more Exeter Ransacker incidents all the way through 1976, but the con- the conventional wisdom in all of this is that these were all very separate and discrete series. But beginning in June of 1976, there would be no more Visalia Ransacker or Exeter Ransacker attacks. It seems that Joe was purposely avoiding, as of 1976, Visalia and Exeter as a whole, at least as in, you know, in a criminal capacity. Right. And apparently his sister and even brother would continue to live in Exeter and Visalia region for quite a while, you know, giving him a place to stay. Um, It doesn't matter, though. The crimes, like, virtually stopped in June of 1976 there. Right. And another weird thing, too, is that the Exeter Ransacker, Visalia Ransacker, and East Area Rapist all had crimes take place on March 18th and 19th of different years. Interesting. I wonder what significance those days were. And that's something that a lot of people have gone down the rabbit hole with um, after Joseph James D'Angelo was fingered as this monster. Um, Everyone's trying to figure out what that date, the significance of that date. Like what made him so angry on those days? Right. Like what day did Bonnie break up with him? Um, It wasn't his and Sharon's anniversary. So why does March 18th and 19th continuously pop up in his timeline? I wonder if maybe uh, I'd have to try to go back and see when his sister was raped, Mm because I'm sure that was like a significant event in his life. Oh, I'm sure it was. But before he even before Joe was even released as a suspect in this, before he even came on the radar, the Sacramento Sheriff's Department tried to reconstruct the crimes of these three unknown serial offenders. And that's where tonight's episode is coming from. The cat burglar, flasher, Cordova Meadows burglar and extra ransacker are all coming from these sprees that the Sacramento Sheriff's Department tried to reconstruct. Final piece there. Joe completed his bachelor's degree in criminal justice in June of 1972. Um, He then went on to complete a 32 week internship with the Roseville Police Department. Basically 224 days, almost seven and a half months. If Joe had been hired right out of college, he was a police intern for pretty much all of 72 into 73. That predates his Exeter Police Department days, giving him Mm -hmm. even kind of like a further jump on having access to police equipment and means. Right. And that could be why he then started evolving when the Cordova cat burglar started, maybe. So... That started estimated in about 1972, and it went through 1973. 
The Cordova cat burglar operated in Rancho Cordova and East Sacramento during the 72 and 73. Sometimes multiple homes were also hit in one night. And I've read a couple different reports, some saying about 30 homes, and then some reports say over 50 homes um, were terrorized. So that I'm not sure of, but there are two different, you know. He he's called a number of things within this time frame, so I don't know if maybe they're lumping everything together. Could be. Um, but yeah, he he would hit other, you know, multiple homes in one night sometimes. At one point, there was another series of burglaries at the same time, but these people were caught. And they said because of the Cordova cat burglar, they thought it would be an easy crime to commit. They weren't as smart as he was. <laughs> Nor the police officers. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, at the beginning of this, he was still training to be a police officer. I think he was still an intern and then became one in 73. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, I mean, they were just teaching him to be a better criminal. Yeah, pretty much. Same MO as kind of what you just described. He would enter the home while the homeowners were asleep. He would have a different door or escape route um, just in case anything went wrong. Normally, he would enter through the front door. And then he would spend a lot of time in the bedroom while, you know, the people were sleeping and, you know, creepy stare at them. Uh, (laughs) He would also take valuables, but he would leave the main items. So purses, wallets, things of that sort. Sometimes weird. Right. And sometimes you just throw them outside in the neighbor's yard. Like, I don't know what the point was. Um, Sometimes he'd even leave a pile of stuff from another person's home at the new home. So... Very strange. I know I read a report where one of the police officers talked about how he would sometimes take an item from a set. So sometimes Mm -hmm. he'd take like one earring. Um, That's a big thing, even all the way through East Area Rapist. That was like one of the big things. He would take one earring and then either take it home with him or just take it to another house entirely Mm -hmm. and then put it with their other earrings. It's so weird. Right. And the thing is, it would be hard because you don't really notice things like that until you go to look for that item. So I'm sure a lot of it might have not even been reported right away or reported at all. On some occasions, people would wake up while he was in the room. No. <laughs> and no, 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 no. Freak- no. Yeah. Right. Could you imagine some <laughs> no. creeper just standing by your bed? But the thing is, at this time in his life, when they'd freak out, he would run away. Right? Later on, that wasn't the case. mm So, yeah, there's a couple different occurrences. There's one time where he started getting touchy. So he touched the breast of a woman and she told him to get the hell out. And he totally did. So, again, this is an evolution from before. And again, speculative that this is even him. But according to a lot of reports, same MO, timeframes match up, all that fun stuff. And it would match the evolution of his crimes. But this is where he started getting a little touchy. So during one burglary, uh, a woman woke up and saw him and he pointed a gun at her and said that he had taken a dollar. I believe it was off the dresser, right? Yeah. And the woman told him to put it back and leave. And he's like, okay, and like put it back and left. (laughs) So no idea. So he he went to leave and he also in the same house was the woman's 17 year old daughter. And she screamed at him to leave as well. And then he walked out the back door. Um, But he did get his change. So he took some change (laughs) off of a table. On his way out. Yeah. So what a freaking weirdo, right? I just like for some reason, and I know it's not funny. I know it's terrifying. And I would probably probably have severe PTSD if that ever happened to me. And I feel for the people that that happened to. But I laugh so hard every time I hear it because I just think of knowing what he looks like now, right? Like this rundown old man. For some reason, all I can picture is him like um, pointing... Uh, a gun at her and sh- sh- and her being like put it back <laughs> right i i don't think that that would have left my mouth put back the doll you know like he said that he took one dollar he had actually taken in that instance two dollars and put two dollars back and so he was like he, she he was like i just took a dollar and she's like put it back and leave and then he puts the two dollars that he'd stolen down and then gets yelled at again by her kid so weird right well and the thing is too from what i've been you know there's so many occurrences and not all of them have, you know, police records easily obtainable. But from some of the interviews with the police, it sounded like he wanted something interesting that he could relate back to the woman of the house, right? So, you know, the earring, jewelry, things like that, stuff from the purse, sometimes pictures. I don't understand the change. Yeah. 
But I, that that part gets me. I'm not sure what compelled him to take change. No, idea. and he had a gun. He had a gun. He could have walked out of that home with probably even more valuables. Right. Sure. I don't get it. Well, here's the part where I know last week I said I had to take a break. And this is the part where my break happened is his first murder victim was actually a dog. So the I, I should say the first noted murder victim is Pups. And Pups was a dog that he killed in February of 1972. He was basically in the next door neighbor's backyard and was barking at him when he was going into one of the houses. So he took a piece of wood and beat the dog to death. There is a lot of details that I am not going to discuss. Uh, but the Grapevine community paper actually ran a story on pups. And then they also noted that there were other dogs in the area that had been killed during the time of these burglaries as well. Well, rest in peace, pups. Right. And, and also, don't forget on the first episode how a German shepherd was chasing his motorcycle when he and Bonnie were out true. on one of their dates. And he had no problem kicking and snapping the dog's neck as they were driving. So, right. Clearly a complete lack of regard for animals. Uh, for sure. And this one, again, the reason why I say it could be the first noted, because we don't know if this person that we're talking about is actually um joseph james d'angelo it could potentially be someone else but i mean come on <laughs> i i think yeah but that poor dog there's also other ones where you know if they were in the house that he brutally killed and then would like leave them in weird areas or someone crawl under beds to die and it just that part it some of the there, there's an interview with some of the police officers that talk about some of the dog deaths and i was like nope can't do it so i'm not going to give you any more details than that because i can't i physically cannot <laughs> um yeah so again this was in rancho cordova so again the area of operation essentially for the cordova cat burglar was near obviously rancho cordova carmichael whitney mission area in citrus heights so later on we know he lived in citrus heights when he was arrested he so literally weird. lived amongst where he committed his crimes. I wonder if he ever had broken into that house prior. Like, he already knew about this house. It's possible. You, you know, like, scouted it out. Who knows? That That's a theory. <laughs> um, But three of the Citrus Heights cat burglaries were within a block of one of the two East Area rapist strikes years later. So, again, same area. So, also to note, he also had... um an extensive knowledge of the drainage canals. I know some of the interviews, the cops say they would, you know, investigate an area and he wouldn't be there anymore. But then a little bit later, there'd be another call saying there's some person out in the area and he would escape through the canal. So just something to note. So everyone that described him, so the people that woke up and noticed some creepy man in their room, Basically described him as a white male between 5'6 and 6 feet, possibly in his 20s. And then they said basically slender to average build is all they could get. And I think it's 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 reasonable to note at this point, too, that D'Angelo had been in the Navy. And if you see pictures of him, which there are plenty from his time around the Navy, he was mm -hmm. in very good shape. He was, right. in fact, very slender. He does end up gaining weight um, throughout the years going forward. And it's actually noted in the future with some victims, right? Like he was a little pudgy or average build. But right. um, at this point, slender to average build is that does line up with his physical description. Right. And then something that I have read is that they are including this information in the investigation. Uh, I can't completely you know verify that i don't have all of the investigation information but sacramento county sheriff uh, sergeant sean hampton said in, the, in an email that physical evidence and the suspect's mo are being used to tie the cordova cat burglaries to the east area rapist and that was written in the la times so this is being included i don't know if they're going to be able to prove it or not who knows well here's another spree that maybe they could potentially um identify him on 
So we have crimes attributed to Esprit, the East Sacramento flasher. And the East Sacramento flasher operated roughly the same time as the Cordova cat burglar. So the Rancho Cordova and Carmichael areas were experiencing flashing and indecent exposure incidents. The physical description that people gave was white male, early 20s, 5'8 to 6 feet, 160 to 70 pounds, thin to medium build, a.k.a. slender to average build. Right. His hair was described as light brown, reddish brown, or dark brown. He was usually described as wearing only a t-shirt with no pants or underwear in sight, and he did not appear to ever be armed. Another creep show here, his MO. So he would stand by the front door, a front or back window, a sliding glass door, naked from the waist down. And whenever a woman or girl inside the home walked close to the door, right? Like say she was in the kitchen, you know, cooking, right? And she happens to come across a big window or the back door. He would knock to get her attention. And then he was standing there exposing himself. Occasionally, he would in fact masturbate. No. Right? So a couple interesting occurrences with this particular series. So in one instance, he actively knocked on the front door. And then when a woman answered, she saw him standing there naked from the waist down. He said, quote, give me a match. She screamed and woke up all the other occupants in the home, but he had already taken off and fled. Now, that is very, 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 very important because later on, Visalia Ransacker did, in fact, steal or leave burnt matches at the scene. Interesting. So commonality there. And then in another occurrence, he followed a teenage girl home from a party and she noticed him tailing her. So she just ran up to a random house and knocked on the door. The homeowner opened the door. And at that time he stood on the sidewalk, dropped his pants and just stared at them. So I don't know where the um, reports come from of like, they say, odd things about his penis size is it from this or later on east area rapist crimes so women eventually describe him and we will cover all of that in detail but women eventually describe his penis as being very small very small and very very thin so i guess my question for you would be you know the east sacramento flasher i could not get an exact number on how many times he struck um, apparently it was enough if it was Rancho C- Cordova and Carmichael. But if anybody knows, we saw the double at gmail.com. But wouldn't someone, and this has actually been a bone of contention in the current trial, right? Of us trying to like, get the current day, modern day after yeah. he was arrested, is of photographing his penis. Yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> and I've seen a lot of reporters not know how to report on that. Just like stop mid-sentence and kind of give the camera a weird look. Um but I mean, like, if this guy was, is, you know, D'Angelo, I just don't understand the point in showing that to people, I guess. I don't know. I don't get it. Yeah, I, I don't understand. I don't know. I mean, is there someone out there who <laughs> no, was don't flashed? <laughs> we don't want the picture. <laughs> I'll call Child just- Protective <laughs> Services. Like, don't do it. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, so... It's it's interesting, operated, same time, same place, same area, and he would masturbate and expose himself. So, so I weird. just really want to know if anyone had a physical description of his penis. I if I if I learn anything else in my life, Amanda, before I die, I just want to know about his penis. Great. Well, you're alone in that. <laughs> I I'm not excited for when the reports start coming of all of that. I don't think that they're going to release it though. <laughs> this has been but, the most anticlimactic like arrest because we he's been arrested for going on two years you know, two years now and yeah. we haven't even started the preliminary phase of a trial so that's true i mean i don't know i know people want justice and i know not everyone is even going to be able to get justice for this mm-hmm. but just knowing that he's just sitting there you know not being able to make a roast anymore kind of <laughs> warms my heart mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I just want him in that little jail cell, and hopefully, no one is talking to him on the bowl. I can't. I still can't. I can't believe that that's the same place. I can't believe you didn't know that. I don't know. I just. I didn't. I Put just think together. of that as a silly Netflix show, and 
just knowing that hardcore people are in that same jail with those idiots, I just feel like, no. All right. Anyways, <laughs> let's go on from this flasher. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> All right. So Cordova Meadows Burglar is another name for this person, possibly D'Angelo. And they operated around 1973 as well. So it kind of overlaps all of this again. The Cordova Meadows burglar struck in another subdivision from the cat burglar. Very close. Now, very, very close. From the maps that I look at, it looks like it's like a big city block, like over a pretty big road away. But it's still, you know, in the same neighborhood. Um, Now, this one's a little trickier to follow because it, a lot of the time gets lumped into Cordova cat burglar, but the police were calling it the Cordova Meadows burglar based off of the subdivision, I believe. And they were the heaviest in the first half of 1973. So right after he became a police officer, I believe uh, breaking and entering uh, this one was anytime day or night. And sometimes people were home. Sometimes people were not home. And the reason why that is interesting is because the people that weren't home, I wonder if some of them might have been the people that said to the police, hey, we're not going to be in town at this time. Mm-hmm. Possible. Um, some of the items that were taken, again, were coins, piggy banks, jewelry, binoculars, knives, um, dollar bills, sometimes food. That's another thing we I don't think we've really talked about. Sometimes he'd just go and eat their food and drink their alcohol. Which becomes a huge, 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 huge MOP for Easter Egg Rapist. Yes. And larger items, he didn't really grab. So same MO as before, like like we've just discussed for a while. Um, same way of entering, for the most part, too. He would enter through either the kitchen door, sliding glass door, something like that. And then he'd open a window in one of the back places of the house as an emergency escape route, which mm-hmm. is very similar to East Area Rapist later. Mm-hmm. He's very uh, quick. He plans ahead. <laughs> yes. Now, the thing that is very different between um, the Meadows and the Cat Burglar is that this one, he always wanted everything very silent from what they guess, because he'd unplug things like air furnaces. Or Is that a, is that a word? Like for, I'll just say. So... In this one, he would unplug some like electronic items, like a furnace, so that it was very, very quiet and still. So a bit different than before, where he just didn't really care what was going on. So very similar again, um, as far as, you know, he'd kill small dogs that got in the way, just wanted everything very quiet. Um, He would also block the front door either with an item or a chain so that I think if, you know, someone was not home, if they were to come home, he'd be able to hear them coming and then get out very quickly. Mm -hmm. He'd also ransack the bedrooms, um, move articles of clothing. Of course, the underwear was one of his favorites. And then in this one too, they, they do note that he would ransack the kitchen. And then sometimes he would leave burnt matches on the floor of the home. Hmm. Interesting, right? So, Super similar, same area even. I'm not even sure why technically it's separated other than the subdivision. But I feel like, you know, he was all over the place everywhere. So don't understand that. Um, now, one thing that stands out on on the Meadows versus the the Cat Burglar, he has so many freaking names. Um, he wrote a letter to one of his victims. Mm-hmm. So... Very strange. The Sacramento Sheriff's Department stated, hang up phone calls and odd communications were also present in this series. And they were reported by the victims in the area. So one particular victim, a 17-year-old girl, was living in the 10,000 block of La Allegria Drive, and she received a suspicious signed letter saying, I love you. Weird. Super weird, because so many weird things with that. She then received numerous hang-up phone calls and a final call where the subject with a low adult male voice stated, I love you. This is your last night to live. No, 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 no. Oh, my gosh. And then just as far as like the hang-up calls, that 
we'll talk about later, that happens mm-hmm. again. So countless times, like even up to like 1990 and up to the 1990s, mm-hmm. hang up calls are a big part of his crimes. Right. So that's why we're lumping this in here and thinking that it's probably him because this MO matches so much. Mm-hmm. Now, something else to note about the 17 year old girl is that she lived next door to the home where the killer of Brian and Katie Maggiore jumped the fence and fell into the bushes during the escape. Mm -hmm. So, again, same area. He was very comfortable in this area. Mm -hmm. So, again, we don't know. We don't know if all of these people are him. Could be someone different that just is very, very similar. It could be his brother, for all we know. I don't know. But some of it is being lumped into the investigation, at least. Yes, and that's a good thing. And so... Just to recap, we have the Exeter Ransacker, the Cordova Cat Burglar, and then the Cordova Meadows Cat Burglar. We also have a flasher thrown in there for just for the, you know, cherry on the shit Sunday. So <laughs> the Cordova Meadows Burglar, as Amanda said, the matches, right? Common MO point, which also matched the Visalia Ransacker MO as far as how he would carefully and meticulously plan entrances and exits. Related to also to the cat burglar, how he would come in all times of the day. So, so many different things are lumping together and have similarities between them. Um, as Amanda said, they're all being investigated and under the same banner. Mm-hmm, for sure. So as we will talk about in our next episode, so we've covered three unconfirmed series, right, that police believe are possibly attributed to Joe. Um, In the next episode, as we've mentioned, we are going to be covering the Visalia Ransacker. Now, the Visalia Ransacker was very, 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 very strange. And he operated over 200 miles from Sacramento in Visalia between 74 and 75. And that series is often by pretty much everyone looked at as the early crime spree perpetrated by the East Area Rapist. Because don't forget, right, in all of this... All police had when all these crimes were being committed is areas. They lumped them together. Cordova Meadows, Visalia, Exeter. It was only based on location. And we had different jurisdictions and towns and cities, right? So the police were not back in the 70s communicating with one another. It was only more recently, due to the internet, forensic science, DNA, you know, that police have been able to take a look back and be like, holy shit, this, you know, go through old police reports and say, hey, this MO of this crime 20, you know, so years ago, 30 years ago, matches one that took place in Visalia, vice versa. You know what I mean? Right. So a lot of these have been reconstructed for the possible attribution. So... Back to the Visalia Ransacker. As I just said, the Visalia Ransacker, that crime spree has been confirmed by law enforcement to be Joe. Period. Full stop. Right. The Visalia Ransacker raided over 125 homes and did a bunch of other vile, vile, vile shit. When Visalia ended, that's when the East Area Rapists began home invasions. So the reason I mention this is that the Cordova Meadows burglar, for the people and the victims who saw him, even in the low lighting, gave Mm -hmm. a physical description that's very much in line with the Visalia Ransacker. So there we have a potential connection um, to what he looked like prior to 1976. The MO of the Cordova Meadows burglar also has more in common with the Visalia Ransacker than it does the East Area Rapist. So as Amanda stated earlier, he evolved, right? Like all of these series was a complete slow evolution of him honing and learning, you know, new MOs, learning how to correct mistakes so on and so forth so right it's i think it's very 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 important and a lot of criminal and forensic analysts will say the same thing that because there's so many similarities in all of these crimes that it's it almost becomes irrefutable that it probably was joe Mm -hmm. so that's why we were actually covering all of these all of these series there are just too many glaring similarities for uh for most people to throw it aside And, and as amanda stated too all of this stuff is currently being investigated. So there may be more coming out as well. Oh, right. It, there's still more going. So so something that we didn't touch on yet, but during the time frame of what we just discussed, he got married. He married Sharon Marie Huddle. She was a friend of his best friend's wife. 
and they dated only for around six months from what I can see in reports before they got married. So he married her November 10th of 1973. So while he was doing all of this, he was, like I said, dating and carrying on with a normal life, right? Mm -hmm. So there's some newspaper clippings about their wedding, and they married at Auburn First Congressional Church. And Per some California marriage records, Sharon was 20 at the time and Joseph was 27 when they got married. Quite an age difference. A little bit, yeah. And the the picture, I, I sent it to Robin earlier, there's a picture of their wedding and it looks really awkward to me. Mm-hmm. Right? He does look thrilled to be there. She looks good. Like, she looks pretty and, like, she's happy to be getting married and he just looks really weird to me. He does not look thrilled. That is for sure. He looks like he got, like, caught doing something in the picture, right? But, like, the bridesmaids and, yeah, everyone looks, you know, like a we- a normal wedding. But, like, if you cover them and just him, he looks very weird to me. Um, I love the bridesmaid hats, though. Yes. Okay. <laughs> now, just something kind of to end with. And I thought this was interesting. So when we were just discussing the evolution, a criminology professor described it as a kind of a graduation theory saying that the suspect initially got the thrill of crawling through the neighborhoods as a cat burglar and watching. And then he evolved to touching, which we talked about confrontations, controls and sexual violence before finally moving to murder. And that interview was done with the LA times and it totally would explain all of it, you know, like how each one added a little bit more, added a little bit more, got away with a little bit more, and then ultimately, yeah, it turned into murder. For those of you following along, we have crawled through neighborhoods mm-hmm. as a cat burglar. We have touched, we have confronted, we have created controls, and we are, I mean, he did kind of weigh in, like wade into the sexual violence piece, um, right. but we're really going to get into that on the next episode. So that's it with the series. And for the next episode, we are going to be discussing the Visalia ransacker um that will be the whole episode because so much transpired in that particular series uh that it is definitely going to be a full episode for sure and then are any valo updates between then we will get to that as well Mm -hmm. absolutely and again if you have any questions concerns commentary anything that you would like us to add even um feel free you can email us at we saw the devil at gmail.com go to our website we saw the devil.com Twitter at We Saw the Devil, Instagram, We Saw the Devil Podcast. And again, if you want that sweet, sweet merch and you want Patreon only episodes, check out our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash We Saw the Devil. Until next crime. <laughs>